I'm assuming the uh, recording is going on. Yep, looks like it's recording. All right, thank you very much. Well, welcome Salt Lake City to today's City Council meeting. As many have heard, we are going back to holding our meetings remotely due to the rapid spread of COVID variants. I hate to say that Utah ranks fourth in the United States in COVID cases per capita. In keeping with our open meeting requirements, I'll read the following statement. As Salt Lake City Council Chair, I hereby determine that conducting the Salt Lake City Council meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present based upon recent reports of an increase in COVID-19 cases. Therefore, we have returned to only virtual public meetings to help reduce the transmission of COVID-19. The council will return to hybrid or in-person meetings when appropriate. Thank you for staying safe and being smart out there. We will now move on to our quick reminder. As many of you know, there is no public comments during the work session. However, join us at seven o'clock this evening for a formal meeting to share any comments. Your feedback is always welcome and you can share with the city council anytime by mailing us at PO Box 145476 Salt Lake City 84114 or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com or by calling our 24 hour phone comment line 801 535-7654. As always, we start with the administration's update. And as always, thank you very much, Mayor Mendenhall, for joining us today. With the mayor, or I think we probably have Rachel on the screen somewhere, Lisa Schaefer somewhere out there, and Andrew Johnson, the Director of Homeless Policy and Outreach out there. So the mayor, the time is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for giving us time to present to you again today. Thanks for pulling the slide deck up and you can go to the first slide. Uh, as you kind of alluded to, Mr. Chair, I, I wish I weren't having to tell you that um, even though last week we said we'd seen record numbers, um, that those numbers continue to skyrocket and the cases continue to surge and are expected to um, going into the next two weeks. As you've heard from the state, uh, both the governor and the state health department, testing resources are really limited. So the, accur the accuracy of the numbers is not something we can rely on. And that's something that we have relied on for the nearly two years we've been um, going through this pandemic so far. So it's, it's a big shift for us as policymakers and as residents, I think, to no longer rely on what the COVID case numbers are. Uh, the goal right now, of course, is to keep the hospital systems functioning and our long-term care facilities and make sure that our first responders and frontline service providers, whether they be uh, firefighters, 911, police, homeless services providers, and those who are working in the other care facilities be able to um, have access to the testing resources that are limited at this point. So the county's message today that uh, Dr. Dunn tweeted out, vax, mask, and stay home as much as possible if you're sick. Thank you for holding your council meeting remotely last week and this week. Um, and uh, please, N95 masks, KN95 masks if possible. Um, and you can visit thisisourshot.com for more information on how to get masks and where to get your booster, where to get your shots. Next slide, please. Um, just as of today, you can go to this uh, covidtests.gov. I did it myself earlier today, and each household can request four free COVID tests that uh, USPS will deliver to your home in the mail. So please um, share this address, get your tests ordered, and um, let's let this uh, information get out to all of our residents here in Salt Lake City. Next slide, please. So because of the insufficient testing and the inaccuracy of the positive case numbers that are coming out, 
we're now shifting to two metrics, which are about the syndromic surveillance and hospitalizations. And sur syndromic surveillance is something that the State Department of Health has been and is continuing to track. And that's people who present at clinics or um, other health places, health clinic and, um, I'm sorry, medical clinics with COVID symptoms. Um, this is before they're at a point of hospitalization. Uh, in many cases, it's earlier on. And also looking secondly at the hospitalization numbers. In the county, we are doubling our hospitalization every 14 days. And this is an, a very dangerous and unsustainable track for this hospital system. We're, uh, have, we have more than 43 Salt Lake County residents, new cases admitted to the hospital for COVID every single day. And as I mentioned, another two to three weeks are predicted for this surge before those numbers start to plateau and go down. So we have about five to six weeks for the hospitals um, functioning uh, or not functioning at an overwhelmed state. Any questions on this? Next slide, please. Here you are again by our zip codes. Uh, unfortunately, not a dramatic change in any of the numbers with Salt Lake City residents. And uh, just, of course, the county's continuing um, as best they can to do the no appointment necessary free vaccination and booster clinics, even on the weekends at the Redwood Clinic and um, at the county complex on 21st South and State. This is our shot.org or .com is the great, the best place to find out all of those uh, vaccination options, of course. Next slide. And you can see the um, transmission index numbers here are, are beyond what high transmission is considered for our statewide data. Uh, just above everything is above and beyond um, what is what we can function uh, with in terms of capacity and whether that be testing or our hospital system. Next slide. Um, actually, I might have Rachel Chima in on this one if she's available, because as you know, the legislative session began today and we've already seen uh, quite a bit of action that uh, some of which was anticipated and others not quite so um, with a with today's timeline anyway. Rachel, are you able to give us an update? Sure, I'm here. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, here are a few bills that have been filed so far that um, have have to do with with emergency powers and or um, pandemic emergency powers specifically. So um, I wouldn't say uh, at least SJR2, actually, I think it's SJR3. I think I made a typo there, so I apologize. Um, either SJR3 or HB182 are a huge surprise, but um, just as a, a quick overview, SJR3, which is uh, a resolution that Dan McKay started in the Senate, um, basically, exercises the legislature's powers to terminate any public health orders issued by a local health department. The this also the legislature also last year gave themselves the um, authority to terminate any local health order issued by a uh, a CEO of a municipality or a county. The resolution, as it was introduced this morning, um, only specified Salt Lake County's mask requirement but was just recently subbed for um, a resolution that actually would terminate Salt Lake County's order, Summit County's order, and Mayor Mendenhall's executive order uh, requiring masks in K through 12 Salt Lake City public schools. So um, we do expect that to get through both houses today. Um, HBR 182 adjusts the uh, local powers of a city mayor and specifically says that no city mayor can issue any order related to public health. It also takes the step of exempting state facilities from any kind of local health order. So that's the Capitol complex and any other state facilities that happen to be located in a county where that county would implement some kind of a public health order. SB 113, um, which I probably am not as um, not, a, not an expert on at all, but this is a Todd Weiler bill that 
essentially puts any implementation of tests to stay into the hands of the governor, the Senate president, the Speaker of the House, and the state superintendent instead of the school and the local education agency. So um, we're still kind of processing that bill, but just so you know that, that that specifically deals with test to stay. So those are the three bills that have been introduced so far and any any questions on those? Does not look like there is. Okay, shock, I'll keep you no posted. Question. Anything else comes up in the coming weeks, thanks. Mr. Chair, I'm um, happy to opine on my opinions on these things, but I think we um, try to keep this briefing informational. So unless I'm asked, we'll pass it off to the next slide. I probably could and read your mind on your opinion here, but I think we'll just keep it to the facts at this point. Thank you very much, Mayor. I'll hand it off to Andrew Johnston. Can I opine, uh, Madam Mayor and Mr. Chair? I won't. Uh, we're going to stick to the numbers on this slide. This is the uh, weekly overthrow occupancy and HRC occupancy numbers. Uh, last week on the total column there, we were at about 97% occupancy across all three of those resource centers. Uh, it's gone up obviously to 98. It would probably be higher except for the uh, King Women's Resource Center had to stop intakes for a few days due to a large number of positive COVID tests. Um, that's impacting all of them, but they're particularly the clients and staff. And so that's why those numbers are probably a little lower than they might otherwise be. Uh, you also see St. Vincent de Pauli overflow uh, consistently running at 70 or above individuals in 58 beds. That's because of flow through those beds every night. Uh, so a high demand there. And we'll talk more about the other ones in a second. Next slide. Uh, next debate, next resource fair, excuse me, is this Friday, probably in the ballpark neighborhood. They're still finalizing details there, uh, trying to follow where uh, the needs seem to be evident uh, week to week. And then probably minimal um, abatements uh, based on lack of staffing at this point. Um, a combination of factors, but we have seen the service providers particularly be hit pretty hard with positive COVID tests. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks are out in some empty positions. So. All those uh, kind of work together towards uh, limited um, work this week. Next slide. Uh, we talked about this last time. The annual point in time count is next week, uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I believe, 27th through the 29th. And they're still looking for volunteers. They're trying to get 500 this year, which is higher than normal. Um, more volunteers, the easier it is to count folks uh, in more efficient ways. And for information, please go to endutahhomelessness.org, the point in time count. And it's a very easy process to sign up and get information. And you don't need any experience, uh, just a willingness to get up early for uh, one day or three days, depending on your interest level. Um, so we can get more information to the council. I think we sent some last week as well and keep updating you there. Next slide. And this is the current overflow situation, uh, top to bottom. St. Vincent de Paul is open during the daytime for um, lunch and dinner for folks. Uh, every night it opens up uh, for first come, first serve on mats. And the Wiegand Center is now the same way, open during the daytime for services. At night, opens up for mats starting at 11 p.m. there, a little later, um, until about 6, 6.30 a.m. in the morning. Scattered motel rooms are um, ongoing for a couple of years now, and those are referral only from the resource centers but there are about 90 beds um, scattered throughout different locations right now, mostly for women um, who move from the resource center into those. And then the High Needs Temporary Housing Program, formerly the Ramada Inn, a number of council members visited last week, and the actual motel rooms are being used for refer only uh, clients from both uh, unsheltered camping situations and the resource centers. And they're focusing on folks who are over 65 um, or who have med medically, um, kind of are medically vulnerable underlying conditions. And they started taking intakes today uh, on a referral basis only. And folks can stay in those rooms 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the end of the season. The overflow beds, the Redwood Road overflow beds, which they're being called internally right now, are the common areas of the Ramada Inn. And those will open in a couple of weeks, most likely. 
Uh, those will not be individual rooms, but more the congregate areas, and they'll be done on a night to night basis. Um, essentially, St. Vincent would, uh, would fill up, the Wigan Center would fill up, and then they'd fill those beds at the Ramada as needed every night. They would only be overnight, though. And so, and in the morning, about 6, 630, folks would get transporta transportation back into uh, the Wigan Center for day services or St. Vincent de Paul. And there'll be, uh, there's already two shuttles running consistently around all the centers uh, on a rotation basis. But then there'll be another uh, van exclusively for that run between Redwood Road location and Rio Grande every day, uh, back and forth. And the easiest way to access all the beds is that number at the bottom, 801-990-9999. And for the general public, that's the best way to call into the system and get help. And so if you need to give out a number, give that number out. And it should be staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week for information and uh, for placement into resource centers. Uh, any questions I can answer, Mr. Chair? Council, any questions? Uh, Council Member Mono, I saw your hand up and then you're... Yeah, sorry, I keep muting my video instead of unmuting my sound. Um, Andrew, if that um, resource fair is scheduled in the ballpark neighborhood, let me know how I can support the efforts there and if there's anything I can do to help get the word out or show up and volunteer what, what you need from me um, in that neighborhood. Well, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Michelle Hoon and Allison Dupler and her team, I'm sure, will reach out to you. I'll make sure they know the information and they'll talk to you. Thank you. And Andrew, one last thing, just uh, my thanks for uh, working on the uh, high needs area and I appreciate uh, opening that uh, resource center. Thank you. Sure, uh, as you may or may not all know, uh, the operator is the road home. The woman with the lease is shelter the homeless. They have emailed their safety and security plan to the council office, you should have that, as well as uh, pictures of the fencing that was required and a number of you saw that, those fences as well. So they have fulfilled those requirements and are continuing to work on the staffing ratios and all the other details about operating that uh, were discussed previously with this council. So they should be on their way to, um, uh, meeting all of those expectations from the council, I believe. Thank you very much. And also thank you for uh, allowing me the time uh, to uh, visit the, uh, the center. Appreciate it. Madam Mayor, anything else from your staff? No, nothing today. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. And we're going to move on and we're going to swap item number three uh, in, in front of item number two. Uh, and we're going to get a briefing on the economic outlook presentation and then we'll go back to the equity update. So for the economic outlook presentation, I have Jennifer Bruno, the Deputy Director, and Philip Dean from the uh, Finance and Senior Research Fellow at the Gardner Policy Institute. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I've been trying to uh, share my screen and I'm not able to, I think it may be on my end. Could I have someone on, uh, on the city end share that and we can maybe just advance that way? I'm thinking Taylor probably has that action right now. Yep, I'm just getting it pulled up. Thanks, apologize, not as familiar with WebEx, so. All right, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to join with you today. Uh, if any of you participated in the Chambers event that uh, last week, uh, a lot of this is going to be familiar, but there is some uh, some additional information I've added here. Uh, I'm planning to take, if it's uh, okay, Mr. Chair, somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes to kind of uh, talk through the presentation and then uh, happy to respond to questions if there's time available after that. Perfect. Okay, so if we can go to the first slide. Uh, or the, I guess the next slide, uh, just in terms of, I uh, want to talk a little bit of overview and you'll kind of see some of these themes come out um, 
throughout the document and going to especially focus on the the economy what's happened over the last couple of years both to the US and Utah economies uh, talk uh, maybe a little bit about some budget impacts that you might see uh, with uh, sales taxes uh, and touch a little bit on property taxes um, that kind of work a little bit differently but uh, as we look back over the last couple of years uh, we've seen a significant uh, amount of economic disruption that's taken place. Uh, this continues, although it's um, much improved from where it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, one thing to pay attention to, I'm, I'm an economist by training. I'm going to talk a lot about supply and demand, and uh, hopefully for an economist that doesn't surprise you, but uh, a lot of the disruptions are on the supply side, and, and we're seeing that today. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see it uh, for a while still. Um, and then the other side on uh, the policy response at the federal level. So there's been massive uh, fiscal and monetary policy response. Historically, we've had much more of a monetary policy uh, controlling the money supply and interest rates, uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, we've seen a massive fiscal policy response from the federal government in this pandemic. And that's primarily geared toward demand. So we kind of have a little bit of a mismatch going on and it's creating some of the economic effects that we're seeing out there. And I'll touch some on different trends. Uh, we have some existing, uh, previously existing trends that we're starting. Uh, so for example, holding meetings like this, uh, I had done a couple of like online uh, meetings before, but how many of us, us do this regularly now? Um, most every day of the week. Uh, also, some new trends, uh, and maybe this is going back to an old trend, uh, but uh, our purchase uh, patterns have changed and, and we've moved back toward goods uh, where we're kind of on this long-term trend uh, for services uh, taking up more and more of the of personal consumption. So if we can go to the next slide. It's kind of three themes. Um, that I've seen as I look through this one uh, is that you need to take care of your people. Uh, it's you look at we're going to talk about labor shortages and what's happening there. And and part of that is uh, firms uh, and governments probably are going to have to start increasing wages with some of what we've seen take place. Uh, there is a significant amount of economic resorting uh, that has taken place and is going to continue to take place. Uh, some of these are just short term related to the pandemic. Some are more long term. Uh, you look at supply chains, supply chains are shifting. People are realizing uh, the their vulnerabilities that are out there and trying to fix that by having other alternatives available. So there's this big resorting taking taking place and then in the midst of that, uh, some demographic changes that are taking place. And the last piece is just that uh, there are those that have been left behind. So even though here in Utah in particular, we see a lot of uh, signs of a very, very strong economic recovery and, and growth, not just recovery from the damage that happened, um, but that's not universal among those uh, throughout the state. So if we can do the next slide. And next one after. So I'm gonna touch here just uh, on some of these major economic indicators. And if we can go to the next one, uh, just looking at uh, population growth, that's a significant driver of the Utah economy. Um, between the 2010 census and the 2020 census, uh, the Utah led the nation with the highest um, population growth rate at 18.4%. Uh, th this is moderated somewhat from what we've seen. So it's not like it's not the highest growth rate necessarily, um, but it's much, much stronger than the US overall. And as you'll see, we, uh, as part of the Intermountain West, we're part uh, of this strong region. So it's not just Utah that's seeing this strong growth. Next slide. So looking within Utah, uh, this growth is uneven. Uh, urbanization continues. Uh, the Wasatch Front and Southwest Utah in particular. Um, Parts of rural Utah lost jobs. So again, this is between 2010 and 2020. Uh, sorry, not jobs, population uh, and uh, significant economic disruption that comes along with that. And next slide. So uh, in this last year, this was our lowest natural increase 
So natural increases are internal population change. So it's made up of births as a positive and deaths as a negative. And uh, these, this is the greatest increase, uh, excuse me, the smallest increase that we, we've had since 1975. So that's going back a long way. Now, as you'll see, uh, part of that is cyclical. These waves of that little dotted line that you see there are population waves from the baby boom and then the echo boom, so their kids, and then baby boomers' grandkids. So that's a piece of it. Um, but then the other piece, if we can go to the next slide, uh, is the impacts of the pandemic that, that show up in life expectancy. Uh, and I do think this is broader than just COVID specific deaths. Uh, I think there, there's a lot going on, a lot that I think needs to be analyzed, but it's uh, some, some significant demographic impacts. So next slide. So Utah has one of the most diverse economies in the nation. This is uh, measuring uh, Utah's GDP and how it aligns with overall US GDP. Uh, and we're among the top states in terms of diversity in an economy, uh, in our economy. Uh, that's very important. Uh, it, it helps in a lot of ways. Uh, it kind of smooths out some of the rough patches. So you look at some of the natural resource states, you look at Wyoming or Nevada, um, you know, when things are going really well in energy production, they do really well economically. And then when they collapse, uh, they see those impacts, right? That, that takes place where we have a much broader base. And yes, we do have a, an energy sector here, but we also have a bunch of other sectors and they uh, tend to give us more economic resiliency because we have this more diverse economy. Next slide. So as, as we look at the response uh, to the pandemic and what took place, uh, look at the last three economic recessions that have occurred, uh, the dot-com bust uh, back in 2001, uh, there was an acceleration of a portion of the Bush tax cuts that, that was uh, deemed the economic stimulus, and that uh, equaled about 0.4% of GDP at that time. Uh, then we look at the Great Recession, the financial system collapse. Uh, you look at the Economic Stimulus Act of 2008, and then the ARA Act. Uh, and those two combined then made up about 7% of GDP at that time. And that, that was considered massive. That was considered an enormous response. Then you look at the pandemic, uh, and officially that recession uh, was dated to be two months long. Uh, the, the after effects are, are continuing, but that's kind of when the decline ended and the upward growth began again. Uh, but kind of these unprecedented, that's like one of the most overused words uh, over the last couple of years, but unprecedented uh, federal fiscal support. Uh, the first wave came in the March, April time time frame uh, under the Trump administration there. Wave two also at the, toward the end of the Trump administration and then wave three in the Biden administration. So if you add all of those up, uh, they equal about 25% of pre-pandemic GDP. So just this massive amount of federal fiscal support that will, uh, that is gonna be over several years. I'm assuming, you know, as a city, you received a chunk of money, both initially and uh, in this uh, wave three ARPA funding. Um, but but there, there was very significant support that was provided uh, when, especially early on, uh, when we would have seen a much, much larger economic collapse than we did see, and there are continuing effects um, that come from that. Go to the next slide. So one of the impacts that we've seen is lower household debt payments. Um, significant portions of that money were used uh, for savings. So savings went up and, and debt was paid off. So at, at a time where uh, incomes in aggregate, at least, uh, grew, uh, people had like more, they had more financial flexibility, both because paying down debt and that growth in income. If we can go to the next slide then. If we look at personal saving during the pandemic, uh, this is a, a massive uh, increase. So, you know, at, at certain points in there, over a third of people's income was saved. 
Uh, again, remember significant chunks of this income were, were coming in from the federal government, and we've since returned to more normal levels, but a lot of that savings is still sitting there. If you look at uh, bank deposits or other indicators like that, a lot of that money is still sitting there and available to households. And it, it's one of the questions I think about uh, inflation and where that goes is uh, like, how quickly is that money going to be spent? Or, or are people just going to want to hold higher savings levels long term? Next slide. Um, this is a, just showing jobs overall. Again, the, the dramatic drop that we saw, uh, dramatic then increase in recovery. Uh, and then if we can go to the next slide, uh, showing for Utah specifically uh, across economic sectors, very, very strong recovery in most sectors. Uh, and this is comparing pre-pandemic. So this is, these are estimates for 2021. We won't have the official data here for a little bit here, but estimates for all of 2021 compared to all of 2019. And um, the two that still haven't recovered, leisure and hospitality and mining, uh, and these are sorted by growth rate, but then it also shows you uh, the, the number of jobs. Uh, again, this is on average for 2021 overall. If we can go to the next slide then. Uh, Utah and Idaho by far lead the pack coming out of the economic recovery uh, or out of the economic downturn with recovery. Uh, there, so it shows the five uh, strongest states. If you, this is again looking at annual data, but if you look at monthly data, you'll see Texas, you'll see Arizona, uh, that are now getting just barely positive uh, compared to their two year ago uh, numbers. Uh, but we still have a significant number of states that are well below their pre pandemic employment levels, and this has some important implications as we think about. Um, monetary policy in the Federal Reserve and how quickly they'll increase interest rates. They're not making um, monetary policy for Utah and Idaho. They're making it for the nation as a whole. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, here within Utah, uh, we've seen improvement in this data if you look at the monthly data. But again, much of rural Utah uh, significant, uh, having significantly higher unemployment rates than the rest of the state where we look at the Wasatch Front, Southwest, uh, Utah, very strong, uh, very low unemployment rates. Next slide. So we hear this term, the great resignation. Uh, I think there's a lot going on there. Some of it's short term, some of it's long term. I think some of it's pandemic, like directly pandemic related. Other portions are not directly pandemic related. Um, but this shows the quit rates. So how many people voluntarily voluntarily leave their jobs? They're not laid off. Uh, they just say, all right, I'm, I'm done with this one. And we're at elevated levels uh, in the most recent data is down a little from what this is showing, but but still uh, significant upticks in in people leaving uh, jobs that that they had held. If we can go to the next slide. So a portion of what's driving that is baby boomers retiring. Uh, so as you look at the gray lines, which is those younger than 25, uh, the yellow line showing prime working years, and then the red showing those 55 and older. Uh, this is, these are those that are, you see that big uptick during the pandemic. Uh, some of it maybe was early retirements. Uh, and some of it, I think, was was people that had been holding on and and not retiring, and this kind of being the thing that then uh, put them over to the edge to make that decision to retire. And go to the next slide. Um, fundamentally, I'm an economist. Uh, I, I enjoy teaching economics, and and one of the things I always tell my students, uh, if you ever have a, a surplus or a shortage out there, it probably tells you your pricing isn't right. And I know there are a lot of frictions to moving to equilibrium, um, but I think that's one of the, the key uh, responses to this is that wages are too low out there, uh, especially in some of these lower wage industries. And, and they'll have to, you know, the, these firms are all going to have to figure out how they manage that, um, whether it's increasing wages or increased automation, whatever it is that they do, 
Um, but but one of the strong signals that it's sending to me is that that wages are too low if if they are in fact having a hard time attracting people. Next. Uh, we are seeing this again at that uh, among the younger population who tend to work those entry level uh, jobs that tend to have lower wages that we are seeing uh, year over year wage increases. And that's where we're seeing uh, some of the strongest growth take place where we're still seeing increases uh, again among these other age cohorts. And I just realized the colors aren't aligned with the other one, but, but here the red represents that young population, not the old. Uh, older population above 55. So next slide. So uh, this uh, graph shows this really long-term time series back to the 1940s, uh, showing the changing composition of the US economy. And so you look at uh, services in the gray uh, have been taking up an increasing share uh, of the economy. And it's, you know, we're, we're a lot more efficient at producing goods. Uh, there's also some aspect of global, globalization, driving down prices of goods, things like that. Um, so the, uh, the red shows non-durable goods, the share of US personal consumption expenditures made up of non-durable goods. This is like food, gasoline, clothing, things that don't last very long. And then in the blue, the durable goods, so think cars, furniture, uh, kind of these big ticket items uh, that we spend money on. So again, we've had this long-term structural trend. Uh, even though that maybe only looks like a little bit, it's actually, you know, that that blip up there uh, since 2020 is actually, these are very sizable amounts in, in some of the uh, non-durable goods, you know, subcategories seeing 20 and 30%, uh, 40, 50% increases um, compared to, to pre-pandemic levels. We can then go to the next. So what, what does that translate into? It translates into small, uh, growing taxable sales, right? Very strong growth that we've seen uh, recently where I think there were a lot of predictions that, so I worked uh, for the state and forecast revenues uh, in that role previously. And I, I did think a lot of those were overblown, especially some of the local government forecasts that we're looking at 20 and 30 and 40 percent uh, sales tax reductions uh, early on in the pandemic. Uh, and not only did that not materialize, um, but we're seeing very strong collections. Uh, there are two things going on there. So one is the remote sellers uh, that we had been collecting a portion of that, but a much larger share of remote sales uh, are now being collected. Uh, but the other piece is just this shift uh, to goods uh, that are generally taxed where services uh, are not taxed uh, to the same extent. Uh, and then the other piece is price increases in the price of a lot of those goods uh, with inflation. So uh, just one thing here, though, I, I definitely urge caution. Uh, I think there's a lot of question about how much of this is a, a temporary blip and ongoing, and it's gonna be one of those hard things that you'll have to manage in your budget is thinking through what of this do we think is sustainable uh, that, that we feel like we can dedicate to ongoing uh, allocations. Um, and, and you're likely to see increased expenses with inflation that's occurring in the economy. Uh, and at the same time, there's some risk there in terms of the um, what's gonna be sustainable and continue long-term and what as people spend down their savings uh, or go back to normal purchasing patterns, pre-pandemic normal, um, if that comes back, like it's it's kind of a, a, a tough place, I think, to be putting together budgets. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, the sting of accelerating inflation uh, that, that we're experiencing, we're, we're hearing about it. Uh, there used to not be many of us in the state that talked very much about inflation. Uh, it was kind of one of these boring things that economists like me talk about. And now it's, you know, just kind of kitchen table discussions. People, uh, you know, our, our meat now costs 20% more than it did. Gasoline costs a lot more than it did. Um, it, it, housing that we'll talk about in a second, uh, costing a lot more. 
so this graph here just showing the CPI, the consumer price index, this is what you'll typically see. Uh, the blue showing the producer price index, uh, which is, uh, as you think about consumption, we have services and goods, uh, the producer price index, a lot of the volatility that you see is more focused on goods. Uh, so that's part of why you see difference. Um, and there's a lot of amplification that you'll see, right? The producer price index goes a lot higher and a lot lower. But if you kind of um, average some of that out, you kind of see the trends. And where the producer price index uh, toward the end of 2020 was at growth rates not seen since the 1970s. So very, very high uh, increases there and just a lot of disruption going on right now in terms of supply, uh, which is driving up prices. So next slide. Uh, this is an index. I've seen criticisms of this, but it's at least something kind of looking at a measure of global supply chain disruptions. Uh, you know, I don't know how much accuracy there uh, is to this, but I was reading over the weekend even about um, additional disruptions that people uh, think may be coming. Like our, our baseline assumption is assuming a lot of these supply chain things start working themselves out over the next three, six, nine months. So toward the end of the year, we're in a much better place with supply chain than we have been or than, than we are right now. But, um, you know, there, there's a lot with uh, with China and some of their policies uh, of, of shutting down factories or shutting down ports, um, like over the last week or two, that some people are predicting uh, are going to exacerbate those supply chain disruptions. And, you know, sometimes it's... It's easy to think, oh, so maybe there's like a week delay there, which leads to a week delay here. But the way it really works is you get these bottlenecks, so a week delay there or two week delay there um, might be two or three or six or 10 months in delay as all the pieces don't come together the way that they typically uh, come together in supply chain. So if we can go to the next slide then. Uh, people's short-term expectations about inflation are changing. This is actually the biggest concern to me. Um, Long-term expectations are still closer to historical norms, um, but this is where inflation can spiral out of control. You have a wage price spiral where people demand higher wages, uh, firms pay the higher wages, and then pass that on to consumers and higher prices. Um, we're starting to see uh, things outside normal levels. Again, probably within normal levels, if you look uh, for the survey looking out three years or five years instead of one year. But it's this is what I'm paying attention to uh, at least as much as the monthly indicator that comes out um, about what the CPI inflation is. If we can go to next slide. So part of why people are, uh, their expectations are changing is like what they're seeing day to day in their everyday lives. So you look at uh, car prices that, that have received a lot of coverage very significant increase, I think, in this last uh, used car prices uh, over the last, uh, in the last report, were like a 38 year over year, 38% year over year increase uh, in, in terms of prices. So uh, you're not seeing the same thing. You're seeing increases for sure in new car prices, but not the same uh, as in used car prices. So this is one of those uh, uh, places where we're seeing different impacts on, on different people. Uh, and if you own a car, that's great. Uh, if you don't own a car and are trying to buy a car, uh, maybe that's not so great as, as you look at um, what that's going to cost you out of pocket. So if we can go to the next. So this is one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on just looking at uh, home prices. So this is Utah data looking at our home prices here, quarterly data. Uh, at a 28% year over year uh, increase in home values. Uh, this impacts your property taxes in different ways uh, for new home construction uh, that you'll pick up some new property tax revenue for, for that with truth and taxation. Uh, you have a, a broader tax base, uh, but the rate at least initially uh, will float down to the certified tax rate. Uh, but uh, I think this, this year, uh, in assessments that I saw, and I didn't look at Salt Lake City specifically, but um, I don't think home values are fully reflected uh, in current assessed values, uh, but that should be happening uh, over this coming year uh, as those uh, property values, you know, as properties get reassessed, uh, pulled into that property tax base, um, I think there'll probably be more attention 
uh, over the coming year in terms of uh, residential home values in in and kind of relating that in in the world of property tax. Uh, next slide. So uh, interest rates have dropped very significantly. They've ticked up a little bit uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but you look from any historical standpoint, uh, this time series going back to the 1970s, so for 50 years, um, very low mortgage interest rates. I think these will uh, increase. The Federal Reserve is going to, uh, they have been involved in these markets directly, uh, where they used to just deal with short-term rates. Uh, and it's. I think you'll see continued uh, rate increases. But again, this is something uh, where where we have this division between uh, impacts uh, in society. Uh, you look at, so I'll just use my own personal example. I refinanced my mortgage, uh, saved some money in my household budget. Uh, there's benefit to me from higher home values. Uh, so I have my assets worth more and my payment went down during the recession compared to someone who's trying to get into a home uh, they they don't have that upside that the people that own assets prior uh, to the pandemic have experienced. And if we can go to the, the end of the next slide, and if you look at rents, uh, it's that much more. Now I, I think this is rents on new, uh, like new leases. So it's, it's I think doesn't fully capture like it's going to overstate uh, if you have a lease that, that carries over. But we're among uh, the highest. This is not just Salt Lake City proper, but the but the MSA, so Salt Lake County more broadly. Um, very significant increases in rents, and again, uh, so housing costs uh, going up for many people. Can go to the next slide. Um, with all of this, homes are selling very quickly. This is kind of a, a good real time indicator of what's going on in real estate markets. How long are homes staying on market? Uh, if we can go to the next, uh, we have this imbalance in supply and demand. That's what's driving a lot of what's going on. Certainly low interest rates are a major contributor as well. Uh, and a lot of this is the overhang from the Great Recession, where in the last couple of years, we actually have built more housing units than we've had increases uh, in the number of households created. Um, but there's still kind of this backlog uh, from the aftermath of the Great Recession that still hasn't worked its way through the system. We can go to the next slide. Um, very significant negative impacts. Uh, so there's some information on the State Board of Education in terms of, of, of the impacts of learning disruptions. Uh, I know there are efforts going on all across the state uh, to try to overcome some of these, but some very significant disruptions. Uh, and, and I think as, as you look back historically at different, we've never had something like this in recent history at least, but you look back historically at some of the impacts of, of different uh, economic recessions, uh, that some of these impacts are lifelong. And I, I think it's something we really need to focus on and grapple with uh, as a society. All right, if we can go to the next slide, just as I wrap up with our forecast, uh, if we can go to the next one. Uh, we're projecting continued population growth at levels similar to what we've had uh, over over the prior year. Uh, we're projecting continued very low unemployment uh, for the U.S. Uh, the what's called the natural rate of unemployment or the uh, kind of full employment is usually considered to be somewhere around four and a half percent, somewhere in that range. I think it's a little bit lower for Utah, maybe three and a half to four percent. Uh, but here we're projecting much, much lower. These are these are record low levels of unemployment that we've ever had. Um, and so that's something to keep your eye on. It's something that's going to limit our economic growth is availability of labor. Uh, and that's why I think we'll see um, we will see growth in jobs. I think it'll be less uh, than it could be. There are a lot of openings out there that, that firms just won't be able to fill. So we're projecting a 2.7 percent uh, job growth rate, which is still fairly healthy uh, around our long-term average, slightly below, but but pretty close to our long-term average. Uh, we're projecting increases in total wages and continued increases in home values uh, in the coming year. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, there are a lot of risks to the forecast. I've, I always like to maybe have a couple tailwinds and a couple headwinds, uh, you know, two or three or something, but there's just so much going on right now. Um, 
the the pandemic that continues to be uncertain uh you, you look at and headwinds so things coming at us that we'll have to deal with uh housing affordability just overall inflation not just in housing but in other goods uh the labor force dis disruptions that we're seeing with great resignation supply chain disruptions uh, I do think the federal fiscal support uh will uh dwindle uh a lot of those funds uh especially from the ARPA Act are still available for several years. So it's not like a, a cliff that's dropping off, but but funds will be allocated and spent in the economy over a couple of years. So that, that will be a level of continuing fiscal support, but it's certainly not gonna be like it was. Uh, and then just the impact of increasing interest rates uh, that I think are likely, but kind of how that all plays out, uh, how quickly it happens, that's where I think there's still a lot of uncertainty. And then if we can go to the next slide, just uh, a quote here uh, from President Randall here from the University of Utah. Um, it's one of my favorite things. It's uh, really easy as we talk about economics, it's like called the dismal science, right? Uh, but one of the things I enjoy about economics, it's, it's about people and understanding how all these things out there uh, influence people. And I think that's bottom line where we need to have our focus. So that concludes my presentation. I'm uh, happy, Mr. Chair, to respond to any questions. Thank you, Phil, for that presentation. And and I did catch your, this is the second time I listened to it. So it was, it was good to hear it the second time. So I appreciate uh, both times. Uh, I open up the floor to the other council members for any questions. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. I uh, I just have some uh, interesting uh, questions. I, and again, I listened to this twice, and I am thankful for this because it helps Sorry, me process the that. information. And uh, um, it is concerning to me that the hospitality jobs are now coming back. Um, people are leaving the hospitality jobs. Uh, many of those jobs, I will argue, they're in probably in Salt Lake City. Uh, and uh, and I wonder if there's any information about its effect uh, to, to our city and our residents. Yeah, so one of the best ways to look at that uh, is transient room tax, because then you're looking at the, uh, at the base. So here we're looking at jobs, but maybe during the pandemic, ho hotels figured out how to be more efficient. So they're still doing as much business, but have fewer jobs. But I think that's not the case uh, when you look at some of the largest uh, job losses, they are along the Wasatch Front. And uh, they're in kind of the, I think there are a couple pieces to that. One piece of it's business travel and the other one's convention travel that, that's way down from where it was uh, pre-pandemic. So I, I don't think you'll see a, a full recovery there. And then in that is also just restaurants. Uh, I, I think restaurants are, are uh, in much better shape uh, than say a year ago even. That, that there are more people coming back downtown um, more than there were before. But I do think there are some businesses that are reevaluating their business model about how much do we uh, use teleworking versus in office and like how all that shakes out. I, I think that that remains to be seen, but it's, uh, I, I can send you the link to it. I don't have it uh, here uh, in hand, but it's, but I have seen data in the last maybe month or two uh, that much of the decrease that we're seeing is along the Wasatch Front. I have one question about uh, the trends here and the economic uh, trends. How do you see them impacting our lower income communities? I see that inflation is, six percent wage growth is at six percent so they're really not going anywhere so how do you think how is it going to impact our lower uh communities yeah and and that's actually total wage growth that, that i was showing there so if you look at uh like average wage growth it's less than that because that would include population growth in that number um so it might be like more three per, three or four percent wage growth and it's as you look at inflation numbers, uh, like everyone experiences inflation individually based on their own buying habits. You know, the data I presented here is national data, 
but you look at um, some of the, the regional data you can get, and I would argue we're seeing even higher uh, impacts than this. You know, you look nationally and the number that was in for housing uh, in, in the latest uh, CPI was three point something percent. Uh, we're seeing much, much higher increases in housing costs here in Utah. They do that based off rents, but but we're seeing much higher increases. Uh, I think this was actually in an article, but I think the like the Western region uh, was around 8%. Um, but we experience inflation individually, depending on what we buy. And uh, where I worry most is those at the low end of the economic spectrum. It, it's, it's those that don't have, you look at where we're seeing it, uh, food, uh, I think that was up like 6% on a year over year basis, uh, but especially meat, really high, like 20% increases. Uh, you look at housing costs, which are, in my mind, are very clearly higher here. The increases are higher here than they are nationally, so that's not captured in that national data. Uh, you look at gas prices, which uh, they, they had kind of bounced around between maybe two and a half and three dollars a gallon before the, the pandemic, say the five years before the pandemic, and then they dropped and then increased a lot. So, you know, a portion of the dramatic increase that you're seeing is off a lower base. But that being said, you know, we've been kind of around, I don't know, 350 to four, and now they're a little bit lower than that. Um, but some of these very basic things are where we're seeing some of the largest increases. And so that's that's where I uh, worry more. Uh, like I, I have the ability to manage around the inflation that I see, and because I'm not, uh, I'm not buying a new house and I'm not renting, like my housing costs aren't going up and they went down. Anyway, that's that's where I think we need a lot of focus are on those that are left behind that don't own the assets and haven't experienced the upside. Uh, many of them are just experiencing the downside. So the, the uh, undurable goods, food, gas uh that is going up at a higher rate than probably their uh than their yeah. wages are going up so they're going to be impacted more because they're not buying the durable goods but they are buying they need to eat and they need to get to work so those are going to be a big impact on their on their quality of life yeah and the again the the used car thing is i think a really interesting one uh the, the those can be um kind of uh volatile anyway um, depending on on what's going on out there, but it's uh, I, I worry about that and their their ability to manage some of these basic things. I think there probably will be wage increases. Eventually, employers are just going to have to bite the bullet and increase wages uh, in some of these lower wage jobs. Um, but it, it's hard for them, right? It's easy to say, oh, just go and do that and don't worry about it. But they have real wor world impacts from that as well of like, how am I going to be able to pass that on? Or is if I try to increase my prices too much, am I going to go out of business? So it's not, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, but, but I think part of it is this baby boomer retirement ripple effect. And I think, so I think part of it is just going to be the new economic reality. Uh, unless there's another question, go ahead, go ahead uh, Councilmember Paula Morris. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I, and maybe I missed it, uh, but I had a question about what's like the overview of um, the income levels, either at the city uh, as a whole or the county as a whole, like how many people are in this group, how many people are at the, or percentage of people are re at the, poverty level, et cetera. Do you have that so that we understand as well um, how is it affecting, you know, certain groups and how, how many people is it affecting this? Yeah, I, um, I don't have that. I don't have that immediately available, uh, but but I there are some links that I could send uh, to your staff and maybe they could distribute uh, for some data sources that may have more detailed information. It would be, uh, you might eventually get some like tax data at the city level, um, but more likely on income, it would be at the MSA level. Uh, so it would be, you know, essentially Salt Lake County as a whole, not just the city, but, but there may be some, 
Like eventually census gets data out, but those tend to show up with a longer lag. Okay. All right. Yeah, I would be interested um, to have those links, but or well, at some point when it, when we have the information to understand like the composition of the county at least to understand how many you know uh, people are left behind in the in the lower um, stratosphere, I guess, of incomes. So, thank you. One more, another question on. Uh... The global supply chain disruption and then in our economy. I mean, you would think that the global supply chain would start to uh, level out, even though the lead, lead times would go up, but there would some the disruptions would kind of kind of level out, lead times going up. But how does that those lead times, and especially like in the microchip industry, how does that affect the Utah economy uh, as far as healthcare is concerned, cars? Use car sales or or and construction of smart homes. Do we see anything yeah. changing there? I mean, we're like that's our our baseline assumption for our forecast is that we do see those issues start working themselves out over the next three, six, maybe nine months. Um, but but I that's a very significant risk. The forecast that it that they don't work themselves out. That you know it, it's uh, I don't know if any of you saw. I think it was in the New York Times. I can't remember. Uh, showing like bullfrog spas from here in, in Utah that manufactures spas uh, and where they get all their pieces from throughout the world. And if they don't have this one single part, uh, it creates disruption in their entire production process, right? They can have everything else working perfectly from 30 suppliers from around the world. But if they have a single uh, supplier, uh, the, a single part that they can't get, uh it it creates disruption and so as i i wish i had a, a silver bullet uh like here's how we solve all this and here's uh like here's what's going to happen but i think there's still just a lot of uncertainty and i thought by now we would have more and more certainty about what happens there but i think it's just not there yet i think there's uh you have this whole uh, reshoring effort that's going on of of um getting again these these not relying as much on china and looking for other places uh for parts but that takes time and uh if, you know if, if you're a manufacturing company you're going to be reluctant uh to do it if you think there's a short-term thing uh to relocate to somewhere else so Well, thank you very much, Phil. This has been wonderful. Uh, any other questions from the council members? Well, thank you very much for adjusting your schedule. Uh, I know you have a class to go to, so I hope your students get as much out of your classes as we got out of your presentation here. Uh, thank you very much for that, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on the on the panel again. Yeah, happy to do that and appreciate, again, your flexibility and working with me on, on my schedule and look forward to continued discussions. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You too. All right, Council, we're now going to go back to item two, equity update. And I want to shout out a thank you to Coletta uh, for adjusting your schedule so we could have Mr. Dean uh, give us the uh, economic output. And I think you also have... Uh, Juana with you tonight? Somewhere I have, on I have Roxana with me, Chairman Dugan. Okay, well, the, the stage is yours. Thank Coletta you so is much. our Chief Equity Officer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor Mendenhall. Thank you, Council Members, for the time on your agenda today. I have a really brief update. So the Racial Equity and Policing Commission they will meet remotely today at 530, so they'll be starting here soon. The link for the public to join is posted on the boards and commissions section of the slc.gov website. And to access it, please visit www.slc.gov backslash boards backslash. And then once you get to that uh, screen, please click on Racial Equity and Policing Commission and you can click to see their agenda for tonight and also the link to join the meeting. Um, just for the public, so that you all know, tonight on the agenda, there will be public comment. 
And also Kristen Riker, who is the Salt Lake City Public Lands Director, will give a park ranger program update. Uh, the commission will also talk about their goals and priorities for 2022. And the subcommittee uh, chairs will give updates. So please join that meeting if you're able to do so. Again, I know that that conflicts with city council's meeting schedule, and I'm very sorry for that. Um, but that's the date that the commission picked because the majority of them are available on that day. So we will make sure council members that we bring you back continuous updates so you can stay in the loop on what they're discussing and what the outcomes of their discussions are. Also, there are currently three vacancies on the REP commission. Two of the positions are youth vacancies. And so the commission is searching for two members between the ages of 16 and 22 who have strong ties to SLC and are willing to serve a two-year term to fill the youth vacancies. The third vacancy is for anyone who's 22 years or older and who is a resident of Salt Lake City or has strong ties to SLC and is willing to serve a two-year term. For the third position, I just want to let you all know the commission will be reviewing the applications that they have already received in their meeting tonight. Um, but they still are low on applications received for youth uh, members. So if you know anyone who's interested, uh, could you please ask them to either apply through the boards and commission site, or you can email repcommission at slcgov.com for more information. Uh, likewise, there are two vacancies on the Human Rights Commission, one for District 3 and one at large. So if you are a resident of Salt Lake City and interested in applying, please go to the boards and commission site and click on Human Rights Commission for more information on how to apply, or you can email hrc at slcgov.com. And really quickly, I just want to thank um, Mayor Mendenhall, Councilmember Fowler, Councilmember Pewey, um, also REP Commission Member Davis, and HRC Commission members Stoll and Wessel. Wessel. They participated in a panel discussion uh, on MLK Day, and it is available on SLC Gov's website. And also it's available on our social media channels for the public to review if you would like to. Um, the topic of discussion was around MLK's, or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and his work and how it relates to human rights work and also civil rights work and racial justice work that's relevant to Salt Lake City. And I do want to thank former youth REP subcommittee member MJ Powell for moderating that discussion. And my final update before I introduce Roxana is on February the 1st, Ashley Lickley, who is the ADA coordinator and myself, we look forward to bringing the Accessibility and Disability Commission Ordinance proposal to you all for consideration. Um, and so, as many of you may know, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, they currently exist, but we are proposing an ordinance to help elevate their work and to make them an official Accessibility and Disability Commission. And so, we look forward to bringing that official proposal back on February the 1st. And then I'm super excited to welcome our new language access coordinator, Roxana, to our team. This is her second week back at the city. And um, I have to commend her because she came back and immediately started working. So she came back and immediately started coordinating the recommendations from the language access task force that have developed over the last few months. And so Roxana is here with me today, and I would love for her to briefly introduce herself right now if she's on the line. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Coletta. Um, it's great to be back. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself. I'm excited to be back at the mayor's office in this new role, um, helping the city to provide uh, language access services to our growing diverse community. Um, professionally, I, I bring almost two decades of uh, uh, experience in journalism, communications, and public involvement. I worked at the Salt Lake Tribune and at the Office of the Utah Superintendents uh, of Public Education um, in the private sector at a civil engineering as a consultant, and uh, most recently at the mayor's uh, communications team. Um, a little bit about me uh, personally, 
um, moved to the States when I was 12, immigrated uh, from Honduras with my family. I grew up and completed my undergrad in Minnesota, of all places, um, but have resided here since 2006. And um, I've just uh, since developed uh, a love for all things outdoors. Um, as a native speaker, a Spanish speaker, I should say, not English native speaker, um, I've, I've experienced firsthand the challenges of uh, navigating an uh, English-only world. Um, so I look forward to working uh, together, for us working together to build our language access policy and our capacity to continue towards creating a more sustainable, equitable, um, and inclusive opportunities for everyone here in Salt Lake, um, regardless regardless of their background and um, language abilities. So thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Roxana. And this concludes our update to you all, city council members. Um, as always, thank you and the mayor for your continued support that our team does. Thank you, Coletta, and thank you, Roxana. Is I think Anna has a statement or question. Yeah. Uh, like a like a welcome and a thank you and I just wanted to extend the invitation and I'm going to volunteer three council members here too if you know if Roxana you ever want to um let me go back a lot a lot of his a lot of Spanish speaking residents of Salt Lake City are not accustomed to or very um uh, they don't participate all, often in the civic process. Basically, they don't they don't really watch this, you know, these meetings or participate or give opinions. Uh, and so now we have four council members that speak Spanish plus Roxana working really hard on the language, you know, breaking this language barrier. So I wanted to volunteer ourselves if Roxana ever wants to have a little town hall meeting to even explain what a council, you know, what a city council does, what the mayor does uh, in Spanish open to the public. I, I'll be happy to be there and I'm sure the other council members will too, so. I, I, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Councilmember Puy, you get, did you have something to say also? Yeah, it was just um, more of a welcome, but bienvenida. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm new here, so uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you and um, and uh, to to help our our uh, you know Spanish speaker citizens to uh, understand what this government does and to get them involved. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Helena, as always, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and energy working with us. And Roxana, welcome back to Salt Lake City. Thank you, y'all have a great evening. You have thank a great you. evening. All right, council, we're moving on to our item number four, and we have three board appointments for the Community Development and Capital Improvement Program. And just for everybody's uh, awareness, you know, uh, board appointments shall be made by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council. And today we have three uh, interviews, the first one being Richard Navarro. And it, I, I'm not as skilled at Amy looking at squares quickly, but is Richard here? How about? Sorry, Mr. Chair, I don't see him yet. How about Jenny Bonk? Mr. Chair, I think the only person who is here for a board appointment is Jake. Sorry, I don't Jake. have his last name in front of me. That's uh, Jake Scott. That's correct. Jake, well, welcome. Uh, welcome to the City Council and you were uh, interviewed and uh, selected by the, or appointed by the mayor and we're gonna advise and consent you and it's your time for interview. Tell us about yourself and uh, you got a couple of minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'm originally born and raised in Evanston, Wyoming, uh, just about 80 miles from here. 
um, came down to the University of Utah in 2003 after high school. And um, other than leaving for a few years to attend law school, I've spent uh, my adult life here in Salt Lake, um, living in the Salt Lake area. I live in Liberty Wells area right now. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, just interested in uh, urban planning and different aspects of city government. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in geography uh, with an emphasis in geographic information science. And um, I currently work for the Department of Veterans Affairs as a fiduciary service representative, um, assisting um, disabled and um, elderly veterans finding people to help manage their benefits. And um, working with city government has always been something I've been interested in and applied uh, for a, a blank or a blanket application to boards with the city uh, when a bicycle position came open on the bicycle board um, and just happened to get a, a contacted for this um, this board later on and it seemed to fit me perfectly so i'm happy to answer any questions or um, anything else anyone has for me thanks jake i open the floor up to the council any but you have a question for Jake as an appointment. Jake, it seems like you're uh, scot free here on the questions from the city council. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you for your time. Uh, tonight at the on the uh, formal meeting, we will have your name on the consent agenda. As others would say, you. You need not be present to win. Uh, and I appreciate your engagement and I appreciate your volunteering for to work with the this, this city. This is uh, much appreciated. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, counselors. I appreciate it. And Mr. Chair, I believe you. we have Jenny Bonk here. All right, uh, Jenny. I see that you've uh, applied to be a board member of the Community Development Improvement Program. Uh, great to have you here. Tell us a little about yourself and why you want to be on this board. Happy to. So my name is Jenny Bonk, and I'm a resident of the Liberty Wells community. And I've got a high schooler at Highland and an elementary school student at Whittier. And I wanted to join the board. Actually, it was the mayor who joined one of Liberty Wells council meetings and uh, suggested that we get involved by joining one of the boards. So that was why I joined. Um, and normally during the day, I'm full-time uh, change management and communications consultant. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for uh... Recruiter, your recruitment efforts. Are there any questions from the other council members? Jenny, you're also off the hook. Uh, thank you for engaging and thank you for volunteering on this board. As I told Jake, uh, you'll be on our consent agenda at the seven o'clock formal meeting and you need not be present to win. Uh, appreciate your work and uh, you have a great evening. Thank you, thank you everyone. And Jennifer, is Richard here? I do not see him yet. Um, and we've contacted him, but he hasn't responded. I'm wondering, I know this is not ideal, but I'm wondering if the council would take a couple minutes break. He wasn't scheduled to be on until 545. Right. Um, I don't know if you guys want to take like a 10 minute break. Sorry about this. <laughs> Uh, you know what? We should we should give him a, a few minutes. So let's take a uh, uh, if we can have everybody here by uh, five forty five. I know we're going to take a break here, and then we'll come back, go out for a dinner. But let's take let's be back at five forty five. Richard is here, so we're going to continue with our board appointment interviews for the appointment on the community development and capital improvement program advisory board, and our next. Uh, Appointment is with uh, Richard Nazaro. 
Richard, I see you're on the screen there. Welcome. Uh, thank you for volunteering and thank you for uh, applying to be on this board. Uh, this is a, our interview process, and, but tell us about yourself and why you'd like to be on this board. Yeah, uh, I moved to Salt Lake uh, two years ago, just before the pandemic. Uh, kind of traveled all around the country. I uh, grew up in New York, was in Texas with the military for a while, and then California. Came here and uh, it immediately felt like home. And so being involved in civics and local politics is something that I've always wanted to do, kind of give back to the community or help shape it and uh, give whatever unique insights I might have. And so the opportunity came up and just thrilled to be here. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Two years in Utah and you're already serving on our board. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and I have to ask, since I'm a former military, what were you, it must have been, what service were you in? I, I was in the army. I was a uh, military police. Gotcha. Probably out of foot hood the area. Okay. Woohoo! Go army. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fly navy. Fly navy. Sorry. Any questions, Bobby? We I digress. Any questions from the council? More than a question is a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to say uh, that it felt like home because you are ten steps from District Two, so the West Side. So just saying, <laughs> just throwing that, that throwing it out there. Yeah, this guy's got so many things going for him, like former military, New York, almost made it all the way to the West Side, like engagement <laughs> two years in, like it's all around, just quality. All right. Thank you, uh, Richard, for uh, applying and for volunteering and engaging with the city. Uh, this is an advice and consent. You'll be on our consent agenda this evening at, at the seven o'clock meeting. You need not be uh, present to win, uh, and I appreciate your engagement with the city. Thank you guys thank for the opportunity. Thank you very much. You too. Have a good night. You too. Dan, you're muted. Of course. Thank you. Our next uh, item is number seven, standing items, report of the chair and the vice chair. Darren, do you have anything? I do not. Thank you. Well, board, I, I'm going to, I have two things I want to uh, talk about. First one is the redistricting application ends on the 26th. So uh, resident, residents, if you want to apply, you got to the 26th to re, uh, apply for the redistricting application on the or the working groups. My second statement goes back to the very beginning of the work session and on the COVID numbers. Just some facts. Utah is the fourth highest COVID per capita in the states. Our ICU beds are full. Our pediatric numbers are increasing. Those are just some of the numbers. And whether this is a report or just a personal, personal privilege, COVID-19 does not have a party affiliation. It does not have a religious affiliation. It does not care of the color of your skin or your gender or your ethnicity. It does not discriminate between saints and sinners. It takes all opportunities to cause sickness and death to anybody. So the best defense is to get vaccinated and wear a mask. It's very simple. We can do this. Let's help protect our first responders and our essential workers. So thank you for that moment. I'll move on to item number eight, report announcement from the executive director. We don't have any announcements tonight, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We have no closed session. So we are adjourned from the working session and we'll be back at seven o'clock for the formal session. See you at seven o'clock.